Hi, Michael Smith here with Teach Construction. So I finally had a chance to edit and, and post another video in our Teach Talk series. Now, in this one, we're talking with Eric Holt from the University of Denver. We did this one a little bit different. We didn't do a deep dive into his program, but rather we're having a conversation about teaching construction and a little bit of uh, experience or a few nuggets from someone that is, uh, has his PhD in construction management, has been teaching at a collegiate level for a number of years, but also came from industry and has a, a wide background in, in, our, in the field before going into academia. I also want to acknowledge all the work that Eric does within the NAHB student chapters, with the local HBA, with, with uh, his students in a solar decathlon. The list goes on and on and on. And, and I just wish we can have more people like Eric that are really just tirelessly advancing our industry. So, all right, I'm going to stop my gushing about Eric and let's jump right into that video. Eric, I want to thank you for joining us today uh, as, as we chatted a little bit before our conversation, but our whole goal really for this is just to have a few minutes chat about your experiences teaching uh, and, and maybe a few tidbits you could uh, offer to, to the viewers of this course and really to set the stage a little bit. The viewers of this course are those that are in industry and have been asked to train really the, the next generation of a workforce. So that might be through a formal apprentice program, that might be through an informal apprentice program, but really just training uh, new guys coming on. And, and you know, almost everybody we know that is doing apprentice programs or formal or informal, they know what they're doing. They've been doing their job for a long time, but making that shift to teaching somebody is a little bit different. And, yeah. and I thought, you know, I thought of you immediately when I was trying to figure out who who could best throw a few nuggets or a few tidbits to those that are about to embark on uh, a new chapter of their career, maybe of doing the work or managing a crew, doing the work, but now having to teach a crew. So uh, I really appreciate you taking a few minutes uh, of your time. Uh, but I, and I'll, I'll just throw you a few questions too. But you know. Um, Maybe we'll start with, though, give me a little bit of your background, just so whoever is watching this can can understand the, the bucket of wisdom that you, you bring to the table. Yeah, where I've been, <laughs> where I'm going. So, yeah, I, I was in industry, gosh, uh, through 2007. I, I've had a very eclectic career of uh, being a lumber sales, building inspector, project manager for a home builder. Uh, drawing house plans on the side, owning an architectural design firm. And so, yeah, it very much... You know, doing it in industry is one thing, teaching it is another thing. And so in 2007, I went back to grad school while the market took a big realignment and fell in love with the teaching side and had to learn because I wasn't formally trained as a teacher, wasn't uh, what I think I would be doing now in the later part of my career. But here we are and I love it. And and so I, I, I went out and learned from some of the, the professors that uh, taught me in my undergrad and now in grad school and things like that and what really works and what doesn't work in making that transition. It's not easy. Um, and just to sit there and lecture at someone is not a good way to teach. So it, it is, it's taken some time to learn what works, what really works and what doesn't work. And usually you, you know, you, you learn along the way and figure out <laughs> that wasn't a good thing to do. Let's not do that again. So, so yeah, a lot of times in teaching industry, you're going to have people in the classroom that are there that have a very low knowledge of what you're talking about. And you're going to have people there that are very high knowledge and you need to get them interacting and talking together because the classroom or the community can be teaching each other, not just, I mean, I, I think of myself more as a facilitator if I'm doing it right. If I'm just a talking head through for the whole hour and a half of class, then I haven't done a good job of prepping students, having them come prepared or asking right questions of them to get them talking and asking questions. So you brought up a, a, an interesting topic, though, where you have you're going to have a wide range of knowledge coming into your class. Yeah. You're going to have some students and, and, and this is no different in apprentice programs that know a ton and just haven't been through the formal apprentice structure yet. And you're going to have some students come in and, and don't know a ton. Yeah. How do you deal with that when you've got such a difference in uh, knowledge base from your, your students? One of the first things we do in, in a class working with super, construction superintendents is, I mean, take the first part of the class to, to ask everyone who they are, get their names, the backgrounds of how long they've been in industry, uh, what projects are they working on, uh, the companies they work for. I mean, we literally go around the classroom 
And you can tell the seasoned guys from the young guys, physically by age and gray hair at the time. But, you know, you you get them talking. It opens up the room. People understand the the varied backgrounds, the varied projects and things like that. And then as we go through the, the curriculum, we're always trying to relate back and ask them what they think. You know, how would they apply this in or how, what have they done that's similar or dissimilar? And if you can get the classroom talking, that's great. I mean, there are, there are definitely some of us in academia that feel like we've got to be the voice in the room. And I disagree with that. Um, you know, I know enough to be dangerous and, and go out and facilitate, but the classroom, if you can get the guys talking or the gals talking to each other and sharing their experiences and their stories, that drives the learning so much deeper and it's so much better than just a talking head at the front of the room or on the screen. And I imagine, I mean, that works even more so in an apprentice model because these are the same people, you're with your peers. Yes. You're learning with these same people that you're working with. So the more you can be comfortable with them, uh, the better. So let me ask you a question. This is kind of pulling back to when you were working on your PhD. So you, you, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if uh, memory serves me correctly, you did your research project or studies on um, different learning types, but more specifically, what learning type are typically coming into construction? Is that yes. somewhat correct? Very correct. I, I did my math or PhD on the learning styles of construction management students. Um, okay. And there's a, there's a lot that you can read out there on learning styles. There's an actual test you can take, 44 questions it tells you. But it, are, are, do you learn by either doing things by hand, more hands-on experience, or by doing some sort of mental exercise or thinking about it type thing? Uh, are you better reading through instructions that are written out or with pictures and details and construction drawings? Um, do you prefer to work together in a group or by yourself? Those type of, of things mm -hmm. like that. And you, you came to the conclusion, I think, that the majority or a higher percentage, I should say, more, more visual-based learners? Is... Yes. Okay. Structure management people, like we like pictures. Okay. You know? So based on that, that knowledge and experience, I'm assuming this is what's proven out after you did that research and you're, you're seeing that in your classes and you see that in your apprentice side, because we see that a lot as well. And, and I myself am a, vi a very visual person, a visual learner. But how do you have to adjust when you're teaching if you know people in your classroom are not visual learners? Meaning you may have been prepared for that, but now you have more kinesthetic learners or auditory learners. What do you have to do? So a lot of really good curriculum and the stuff that I have to do is make sure that I am teaching to the spectrum on that. Uh, you do that through, through good PowerPoint presentations, through videos, through some audiobook reading uh, exercises, um, you can apply or, or come to the classroom with a lot of tools in the curriculum, in your plan for that classroom, for that day, for that quarter, whatever you're, you're teaching for. If you're just going to have a talking head lecture every time, you're only hitting one, one person or one style. But if you've got, you know, some book reading, some hands-on work, some knowledge work, some group work, some single work, some visual uh, some videos. So by mixing it up, you're you're challenging people to use all of their different senses and the way they're learning. And you'll see that in the classroom. Students will complain about the book, but love the videos or really got a lot out of the book. I hated this, you know. So it, it, it because you've got to appeal to a classroom with a broad sense of learning styles and even age and gender and experience affects all this. So coming to the classroom, planning to have multiple different exercises, uh, methods, uh, materials, formats, uh, again, drives that learning home. Even if people shift from reading it to watching it, even though they prefer one or the other, by the repetition of going back and forth, it doesn't feel repetitive and it drives the learning deeper into their brains. So. so not only recognize you have different learning types you have to teach to, but switching that up on some to really drive it in. Yeah, so, and then it, it, it also then changes up the classroom. It it keeps things fresh and alive. People don't get bored with, you know, your talking head or with one exercise. And so it, it, it wakes them up every, you know, time you make a ch change in the format. So whatever it takes to help, you know, drive the learning home. So what do you say to the person? I, I think we've all experienced this, but where 
you hear someone say, I don't know what's going on. I told these guys 10 times and they're still not getting it. Where do you think the breakdown is in some of those situations? You told them. Okay. You know, a lot of times people, you know, they need to discover it for themselves or learn it in a way that where it's not you telling them the way they've either read it, watched it. Uh, it could be part of what you told them, but you've got to tell them in different formats, different uh, programs, different ways. Uh, if they peers tell them compared to whether you told them, um, were they listening to you? You know, after 10 times, apparently not. So um, I guess we also have to recognize that regardless of how many times you tell them, if they don't hear it, yeah. you've got to start really thinking about how you're teaching. Yeah. They, and maybe it goes back to like what you were, your research was on from learning types. And if you're teaching to a visual learner and you don't have a room full of visual learners, you might have a tr trouble with that. What, what I see a lot more of is you got a lot of visual learners and, and the guy telling them is just it's verbal. This is what we do. And it's like, no, you need to show them. As you're telling them, you need to be showing them either pictures of guys doing it uh, or physical details of why or uh, um, something to practice role. But if you're just telling and you're up, and I've seen this where a professor is a great talker, great storyteller, but the, the, you know, the, the verbiage sometimes doesn't connect with the audience. Okay. So... Uh, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of great motivational speakers out there and really good keynote speakers and stuff like that. But your typical teacher facilitator is not one of them. And, and so I don't think I'm one of them. I, I, you know, I, I've got some good stories in the field, but I've got a lot of great pictures and, and industry people to come in and back up. And, and um, you know, it, it really helps varying what you bring to the classroom, the different formats, things like that, that, that again, you, you say the same thing. You told them 10 times, but if was, you told them 10 times verbally, they don't out after one and a half. But if you told them 10 times in different ways, that drives the learning home every time. Right. So maybe if I'm saying it more than three times, I got to change how I'm saying it. Exactly. Okay. What about age difference? So our industries are changing. I mean, it used to be guys that had gray hair or more than both uh, that, that both than we have were the, the season guys. Those are the ones who are teaching, but not all the time anymore. Sometimes you get teachers who might be younger than the people in their classroom. Yep. Any, any coaching you would, you would provide to that, that teacher who's maybe younger than a student? I guess if you look at yourself as a facilitator, again, I'm bringing you other industry resources. I am not the, and I tell this to the, when I, especially when I go into this, this group of superintendents who have, you know, maybe not as much gray hair as me, but definitely more time on the job site than me. I am not the expert in the room. I just know how to talk and facilitate. And, and really, you know, I'm here to get you guys talking and working through one, the material we have to get through, but also to what, what applies, what resonates uh, and get you guys asking questions of each other, because those guys are actually the experts in the room. Um, so if you're a younger teacher and you're find yourself, you know, looking around at a whole bunch of people that have way more experience than you, think of yourself as a facilitator. You're not the expert in the room. And if you go in thinking and, and say, hey, I am because I've got a PhD or because I'm the teacher, you're going to lose them fast. So I was uh, having a, a conversation with a high school teacher from a program here in town, and he had a pretty neat concept he used, and he called it three before me. And he, he said it, I'm like, well, I, you know, I don't, never heard of that. I don't know what it is. And he said, okay, well, let me explain. When he's teaching his students and they, if they have a question, he will ask them first, was it three before me? And what he meant by that, or as he explained it to me, was he has students, one, if you have a question on a project or a build or how do I do something, unless it was a safety issue, he'll answer those immediately. But <laughs> you know, if there was anything else, let's say it was a question about the plan set they had, that student had to look at their notes. So that's one, wherever my camera is, that's one. Two was ask your peer who's working on your group. And three, try to come up with the answer as a group. And if you tried those three, so three before me, then you could go ask him. Oh, that's awesome. And I thought it was a pretty interesting one that really relates to what people are doing in the field. Because yeah. the last thing you're doing is running to your boss every second. 
Again, yeah. if it's a safety issue or a concern, you always go right to the person that you yeah. need. But if it's about the process, it was, okay, check your plans if you're in the field. If that didn't work, check your peers and what it, maybe they know or their plan sets and then go to your boss. I thought it was pretty interesting. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. You're getting them to critically think, analyze. And that's the challenge sometimes we get teaching college students is they expect to be spoon fed and, uh, you know, come in without having to prep or think and, and just listen to people regurgitate information upon them. And uh, some, and that's how some college professors, I, I know some of them that, that think their talking head is the most important thing in the classroom. And to interrupt them or ask questions, you know, where I, I totally disagree with that. And if I can get, if I can get the class stop, you know, to talk and ask questions, as long as you're keeping them on track and we didn't go down the road to the, whatever the latest Super Bowl stuff was, but we're on task for the construction side, then that's, that's a win-win because they're going to listen more to each other and get thinking more about, and, and the interaction in the classroom is going to be more effective than, you know, one guy at the front of the class telling them 10 times. Right. Right. And I imagine anybody of our, our industry partners, I mean, obviously you have two different levels for apprentice type training, whether it's again, formalized through a department of labor approval or not, we've got to teach concepts and got to understand what the tools are and what the process materials are and what the process is. And then you've got to learn how to do that stuff. I don't care if it's framing a wall, setting a door, yeah. running pipe, doing curb gutter, it doesn't matter. You've got to have some of that fundamental, th th those skills, yeah. knowledge and skills combined. So I guess my question would be, what have you done when you have students show up in your, a class that you're teaching without the knowledge they're supposed to have? So I don't I mean, whether it be a prerequisite you had for the course or what have you, but they show up and you're doing a plan reading class and they don't know basic math. What do you do? Do you just say, go, go learn this on your own? Do you take time out away from other students to teach it? Or do you make all students go through those lessons, even though it's stuff they should have already had? I've done all three before. Depends on the class, the age, the student. Uh, sometimes, you know, depends whether I've had a Snickers bar. I'll be nice to you. Or and you're, <laughs> screw it. You're screwed. Go. Um, but so it depends on there's sometimes where, you, hey, you, you know, you're not prepared. You pair them up with someone who is um, to to that you can trust. I mean, you learn in the classroom pretty quickly who are the students that are, that have a, a mentor spirit, are good at teaching, uh, have compassion and can share. And you know those that, that wow, you're great at what you do, but your social skills, no. <laughs> so you don't, you don't, you know, people don't want to be their group partner all the time. So that becomes a challenge because sometimes you, know, you realize that it's just one student do you take away time from the other students? If it's if it's something that's more systemic, like, wow, everybody didn't get these, these math concepts. We need to back up. So I've done that before. And even though you've got some that are, get it, you know, can you utilize those that get it to help bring up to speed those that didn't? Um, or, or do you just like, hey, you we've talked about this. You are woefully unprepared. You got to go figure it out. And, and so that's more, I don't have a good, great, knee-jerk reaction because every you know there, there are there are students that hey i know they're trying and, and i want to have compassion on them. i've had students that i know they're not trying they are literally you know the, the same whining and complaining and lack of preparedness they're consistent i'll give them that well <laughs> treat them as such you got to go figure it out is it since you have experienced it and and, and i have as both from a leading a, a a session but also being a student in some is it safe to say, no matter who it is teaching, you're going to run into that? You're going to yeah. run into students that don't know things they should know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or come to class unprepared or don't care or have attitude. Somebody who is an industry person coming into this and, and now been asked, uh, or they, maybe they volunteered or were voluntold, but they're, they're going to find themselves in a classroom. Any Two little nuggets of uh, you know things that you wish you knew before you walked in to teach your first class. I learned by watching professors that I really enjoyed, and I made notes from those that I didn't. And so, uh, if you're getting voluntold, do your research. Think back to the the courses that you've taken or the training you've been and the ones you've really enjoyed. And what did that professor do? What did that teacher, what would that facilitator do? Think back to the ones, I'm, I'm really good about learning about what not to do by watching others' mistakes. Think about the, the classes that you've taken that were like, wow, I 
that was painful. <laughs> or are the, the the things you've sat through go, I, I, I can't get that time back again. And, and why? What what was the breakdown in that? And, you know, learn from those lessons. So um, that's how I, I mean, I, that's, that's, that's a challenge sometimes in the, as a college professor. I was not trained as a teacher. You know, high school student or high school teachers are more trained how to teach than college professors, especially grad students. They're just thrown into a classroom and sink or swim. And so I looked to and thought back on the courses that I've taken that I've enjoyed and the instructors that I've had that that kept me engaged, that I would take sign up again. I don't care what you're teaching basket weaving, let's go, because of who they are and how they taught and what I learned from. And I made a list of those that wow, I don't want to ever take something from that guy, that person again. So yeah. so find um, those you like and mimic it and find those you don't and just stay yeah. away from that habit. Yeah. And and, and People are constantly changing, formatting. COVID has rocked how we teach. So you're, you are you can't find one way and, oh, that's perfect. That that course or that lecture is, I can just pull it out of the can. Well, that'll get stale quick. So every course, I mean, it's, you don't have to totally revamp everything, but always be looking for what can we do better? What, what's going to, what, what landed best? What jokes work? What didn't? What stories are great? What, what, take that constructive criticism from, the students to make you a better teacher, instructor, facilitator every time. All right, Eric, I, I appreciate you, you taking a little bit of time. I know for those that are teaching a trade apprentice program, I mean, you're coming at it from a different space, but I appreciate the honesty that when you go to school for as much education as you've had, I don't think you can get any more. Um, and being honest, they really don't teach you to be a teacher. You've got to, you've got to learn that experientially. Yeah. Uh, as long as you know your content, understand people learn differently, own that classroom, that is your classroom, and facilitate and 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 really, really help people along their learning journey. Yep. It's okay. a facilitator. That's probably the best way to to explain it. So I, well I appreciate it. And, and I'm sure some of the uh the new trainers to this space are gonna appreciate hearing some of your tidbits as well. I'm still learning. So <laughs> well I appreciate it. <laughs>